open our Bibles to the prophet Habakkuk. Habakkuk probably prophesied during the reign of Manasseh. Now, Manasseh was the evil son of King Hezekiah, and Manasseh was the one that had Isaiah put to death. So Habakkuk was probably at least familiar with Isaiah. But during the reign of Manasseh, the nation of Judah probably went the lowest, uh, at least certainly up until that period of history. They had gone lower into depravity than uh, at any previous time in their history. Manasseh was an extremely wicked king. In fact, uh, according to the book of Hebrews, some of the Old Testament prophets were sawn in two. And uh, it is generally accepted that uh, Manasseh had Isaiah actually sawed in two. Uh, a very wicked and evil man. And thus Habakkuk has spoken out against the evil. He sees uh, the corruption of the government. He sees the corruption of the nation as the result of that. And he cries out to the Lord. So uh, he uh, is warning of the judgment that will come from Babylon. Now at this time, Babylon has just begun to uh, come into a place of prominence. Uh, they captured, as we mentioned before, the city of Nineveh. And uh, the people of Judah really didn't feel any great threat at this time from the Babylonian kingdom because it had not yet become a major world power. And yet there is that prophecy that God will use the Chaldeans as his instrument of judgment against Judah. He begins it by declaring the burden which Habakkuk, the prophet, did see. Now, Habakkuk did precede Jeremiah. Jeremiah prophesied right after Habakkuk uh, in uh, the next period under Josiah's reign and on down, and Habakkuk surely lived uh, during the reign of Josiah and was a contemporary to Jeremiah when Jeremiah was just a young boy. Uh, later on in Jeremiah's prophecies, the Lord forbid the use of this term, the burden of the Lord. Uh, during the time of Jeremiah's prophecy, the Lord said, Jeremiah, there is a phrase that's been used over and over, overused really, and I'm tired of it. Uh, these false prophets are going around saying, the burden of the Lord, the burden of the Lord, when I didn't lay any burden on them. So, God forbid Jeremiah from using this term, the burden of the Lord, uh, but uh, that was before, or that was after Habakkuk's time. So the burden which Habakkuk the prophet did see. He begins with a prayer unto the Lord, a complaint, O oh Lord, how long shall I cry and you will not hear? Even cry out unto thee of the violence and you will not save. He saw what was going on. He saw the moral decline. He was praying, but it seemed as though God did not answer his prayer. Things weren't changing for the better. And it was as though God didn't hear his prayer. 
And so he is complaining unto God, how long do I go on praying, crying about these things, Lord, and you don't hear? I cry to thee of the violence, but you don't save. You, you haven't stopped it. Why do you show me the iniquity and cause me to behold these grievances? Lord, I would rather not know these things. I'd rather not have the insight. Now, he was of the priestly tribe. Uh, he was of the tribe of Levi. And uh, he had a keen insight into the governmental matters. He knew the corruption that existed and uh, it was just frustrating to him because though he could see it, there was nothing he could do about it and it was uh, as though God was not doing anything about it either. So why do you show me? Why do you let me see these things? The iniquity, the grievances. Uh, for he goes on to describe them. The spoiling and the violence are before me. I'm surrounded uh, by all of this crime, all of the evil, all of the robberies, uh, all of the assaults. And uh, there are those that raise up strife and contention. There's just this social upheaval that is going on. And the law is slacked. And judgment doth never go forth. Uh, there is a lack of enforcement of the law. There is a lack of uh, real justice in the judicial system. The criminals are being released. And thus the wicked does encircle the righteous and therefore wrong judgment proceeds. The wicked seem to be in control. Control of the nation, control of the government. And thus, uh, wrong judgment proceeds. The laws are just not fair. So the Lord responds to the cry of Habakkuk. In verse 5, he said, Behold, among the heathen, and regard and wonder marvelously for I will work a work in your days which you will not believe though it be told you. So he was crying about the inactivity of the Lord. Lord, you're not hearing. Lord, you're not doing. It would seem, Lord, that you don't care. God is responding to him and said, I am doing a work in your days. It'll happen in your time. In which you will not believe it, though it was told to you. For the Lord now reveals to him his plan. I raise up the Chaldeans or the Babylonians, that bitter and hasty nation, which shall march through the breadth of the land, to possess the dwelling places that are not theirs. I'm going to use the Babylonians as an instrument of judgment against these wicked people. They're going to come and possess this land. They are terrible and dreadful, and their judgment and their dignity shall proceed of themselves. Their horses are swifter than the leopards, and are more fierce than the evening wolves. And their horsemen shall spread themselves, and their horsemen shall come from far, and they shall fly as the eagle that hasteth to eat. And so they'll come with their armies, the uh, horses and their chariots. And they, they shall come all for violence, and their faces shall sup up as the east wind and they shall gather the captivity as the sand. And they shall scoff at the kings, and the princes shall be a scorn unto them, and they shall deride every stronghold, for they shall heap dust and take it, building up the, the mounds 
uh, the dirt mounds against the walls, taking the cities. And uh, the, the, the strongholds, the, they'll just overcome all of the obstacles. And then shall his mind change, and he shall pass over and offend, imputing this his power unto his God. God said, I'm going to use him. He'll be my instrument of judgment against this land. But then, after I have used him, he's going to be lifted up with pride. He's going to contribute to his God the victory. And uh, thus, Babylon will be dealt with. It has been used by God as his instrument of destruction and judgment, but then Babylon itself will come into judgment from God. So, the Lord has revealed the plan, and this only creates a greater problem in the mind of Habakkuk. So he prays the second time, and he said, Are you not from everlasting? Are you not the eternal Lord, my God? Haven't you always existed, my Holy One? Uh, we shall not die. O oh Lord, thou hast ordained them for judgment. And O oh mighty God, thou hast established them for correction. God, I don't understand this. The Babylonians, uh, you've ordained them for judgment. And establish them to correct us? Lord, you are of purer eyes than to behold evil. So pure. Uh, that uh, purer eyes than to behold evil. And you cannot look upon iniquity. Interesting. We remember that when Jesus was upon the cross, that God laid on him the iniquities of us all. And when God laid upon him the iniquities of us all, Jesus cried, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from the words of my roaring? And then in Psalm 22, the answer to the question, Why have you forsaken me? But thou art holy, O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. God is, is of pure eyes than to behold evil. He cannot look upon iniquity. And thus, when Jesus, his only begotten Son, was bearing our iniquity, the Father turned. And Jesus cried, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Because he cannot look upon iniquity. Now, this is looking with uh, approval. Uh, it, it doesn't mean that God doesn't see iniquity. He surely does, but he cannot condone it. He will never condone it. He cannot look upon it with approval. And so the prophet has a real problem with God's work. God is going to use the Babylonians. Why do you look upon them? Lord, you, you can't look upon Why would you choose them that deal so treacherously? And you hold your tongue when the wicked devours the man that is more righteous than he. Lord, we're bad. We're horrible. But they're worse. And so, God, I can't understand why you would use them, why you would look upon them to be your instruments of judgment and just stand back and behold as they consume at people that are more righteous than they are. You make men as fish of the sea and as the creeping things that have no ruler over them. They take up all of them with the hook and they catch them in their net they gather them in their drag and therefore they rejoice and are glad 
Therefore they sacrifice unto their net. They burn incense unto the drag. Because by them their portion is fat and their meat plenteous. Shall they therefore empty their net and not spare continually to slay the nations? God, I don't understand. These people are just taking everyone captive. They're like catching fish with their nets, with their hooks, with their drags. And then they're, they're worshiping their nets. They're worshiping their drags. And uh, they, are, they are just taking nations, slaying the nations. So the prophet declares, I will stand upon my watch. I will set me in the tower and I will watch to see what he will say unto me and what I shall answer when I'm reproved. Now he knows that he's mouthed off to God and uh, he is expecting God to reprove him for it. And so I'll just go sit and I'll wait for God's response and uh, then figure out what I'll answer him uh, when he reproves me. So the Lord answered him, and he said, Write the vision, make it plain upon the tablets, that he may run that readeth it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie, and though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come, and it will not tarry. The day is coming. Write the vision down. Put it on the tablets in order that people might read and know what's going to happen. Because it will surely happen, though it will be yet for a while. When it starts moving, it's going to move right along. Now, God has declared the judgment that is yet to come upon this earth. And as we get into the book of Revelation, chapters 6 through 18, we have great details of that judgment of God that is yet to come upon the earth. And uh, God has let man know what is going to take place in the last days as God judges the earth prior to the return of Jesus Christ. And we see today the earth ripening for judgment. We see the evil that prevails throughout the earth. We see the godlessness. And we realize that though it has tarried, yet it's going to come. It will surely come. And uh, so God just told him, wait for it. And then the Lord declared, Behold, his soul, which is lifted up, is not upright in him. Uh, earlier he had mentioned the pride of Babylon and uh, how that uh, they scoff at the kings and the princes. Uh, they, they're filled with the pride of and so speaking of Babylon, the Lord said, Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him. You remember in the book of Daniel that the thing that God dealt with Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, so severely about was his pride. You remember the vision that he had of the tree that had grown up and all of the birds lodging in the tree, the animals sheltering under the shade of the tree, and he heard the voice of the watcher saying, cut it down, and the tree was cut down. And uh, then out of the roots there came another tree, and Daniel interpreted the vision for Nebuchadnezzar and said, you know, this is not good. Uh, walk carefully before the Lord. Take it easy, king. Uh, because uh, God is going to cut you down. And so he was behaving himself for about a year. 
But then one day, walking through the hanging gardens and looking at the beautiful palaces and the buildings, he said, Is this not the great Babylon that I have built? And God then allowed him that period of insanity until he knew that it was God who reigned and God who ruled. And so uh, the soul that is lifted up in pride is not upright in him. In contrast, but the just shall live by his faith. The prideful ones will be cut down, but the just will survive. They'll live by his faith. Now this is the word that Habakkuk was going to need in the coming days as the conditions were going to deteriorate. They were going to get worse until the nation would be conquered by the Babylonians. They were going to go through a severe famine. The Babylonians were going to lay siege against Jerusalem. They were going to cut off all of the supplies until the people would be starving to death within the city. And Habakkuk is going to be needing just to trust God, have his faith in God, because there will be nothing else. So the just shall live by his faith. Yea, also, because he transgresseth by wine, he is a proud man, neither keepeth at home, who enlarges his desire as hell and is as death and cannot be satisfied, but gathers unto him all of the nations and heaps unto him all the people. Referring now unto the Babylonian and their conquering of the world, their sacking of the world, their spoiling the world, their taking the treasures of all of the nations. Uh, they are building Babylon with the Treasures that they are uh, robbing from the other nations. And thus he speaks of their wine. You remember when Babylon fell, that Belshazzar was in the midst of a drunken orgy uh, when it fell because he transgresses by wine, because of their pride. Uh, neither do they keep their home. They enlarge his desire uh, as hell. They... Uh, are uh, as death, they cannot be satisfied. Uh, they keep adding more and more and yet are never satisfied. Shall not all of these take up a parable against him and a taunting proverb against him and say, Woe to him that increaseth, which is not his, that one who is getting rich off of others robbing from others to enrich himself. How long? And to him that ladeth himself with thick clay, uh, the riches will become a weight. They will not be of value. They'll be like thick clay, worthless. Shall they not rise up suddenly that shall bite thee and awake that shall vex thee and thou shalt be for booties unto them, Babylon will fall, and they will become then uh, the 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 uh, prey to someone else who will take their riches. The Medo-Persian Empire uh, then conquered Babylon and took the wealth uh, to Persia, because thou hast spoiled many nations. All of the remnant of the people shall spoil thee. Because of men's blood and for the violence of the land of the city and of all those that dwell therein, woe to him that coveteth an evil covetousness to his house, that he may set his nest on high, that he may be delivered from the power of evil. Uh, he now uh, is, is speaking about the woes. First of all, verse 6, woe to him that increases that which is not his. Now verse 9, Woe to him that coveteth an evil covetousness to his house, that he may set his nest on high, that he may be delivered from the power of evil. 
You have consulted shame to thy house by cutting off many people. You have sinned against your soul. For the stone shall cry out of the wall, and the beam out of the timber shall answer it. The third will, woe to him that buildeth the town with blood, and establishes a city by iniquity. Behold, it is not of the Lord of hosts that the people shall labor in the very fire, and the people shall weary themselves for very vanity. Uh, the evil of Babylon, building themselves off of the spoil of the other nations, building themselves by the bloody conquest of other people, destroying others in order that they might gain for themselves. For the earth, and here is, in, here is you know, all of this uh, evil that, that is in the heart of man being manifested. And yet in the midst of this, a beautiful prophecy of the future, of the glorious kingdom age when Jesus comes to establish his kingdom upon the earth. And it, for the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. I love this verse. The day is coming when the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea, so the earth will be covered with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. Oh, what a glorious day that's going to be when Jesus reigns upon the earth. You know, I see the world today and I see the crime and I see the corruption and I see men destroying themselves, sinning against, he says, your own soul. Sinning against your own body. People destroying their own bodies. taking things into their bodies that are just destructive. And, and I see just the blatant wickedness of man. And my heart yearns for righteousness, for the righteous kingdom of God to be established. For that day when the knowledge of the glory of the Lord will be like the waters that cover the sea, blanket the earth, filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. Just a little nugget right in the midst of these woes that are coming, uh, lest you get too you know, press down with, whoa, whoa, whoa. He, he gives you a little nugget in there. Uh, there is a bright hope for the future uh, when the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. But woe to him that giveth his neighbor drink, that puts the bottle to him and makes him drunk, that he may look upon their nakedness. Uh, using liquor as a means of breaking down a person's natural inhibitions. Thou art filled with shame for glory. Drink thou also that your foreskin may be uncovered. The cup of the Lord's right hand shall be turned unto thee and shameful vomiting shall be on thy glory. You yourself will be drunken and uh, just uh, wallow in your own uh, vomit, actually. For the violence of Lebanon shall cover thee, and the spoil of beast which made them afraid because of men's blood and for the violence of the land of the city and of all those that dwell therein. What profit, or what pro profiteth the graven image 
that the maker thereof hath graven it. The molten image and the teacher of lies and the maker of his work that trusts therein to make these dumb idols. Now, uh, dumb, it would be the mute idols, idols that can't speak. Uh, men who make these little idols out of wood and out of gold or out of uh, stone and then cover them with gold. Woe unto him that saith to the wood, Awake! You know, to your little idol that you are there. On, Wake up, little idol, you know. Open your eyes. Uh, and, and so they're speaking to these dumb stones, saying, Arise, and it shall teach. Behold, it is laid over with gold and silver, and there is no breath at all in the midst of it. But the Lord, in contrast, is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. These idols cannot speak. They don't breathe. They cannot help you in the time of calamity. But the Lord is in his holy temple. Now in chapter 3, Habakkuk now responds to the Lord. He's been waiting in the tower. God has spoken to him. God has told him of the judgment that's going to come upon Babylon after it has been used by God as an instrument of judgment. Then judgment will fall upon Babylon. But in chapter 3, a prayer of Habakkuk, the prophet, upon Shigenoth. O Lord, I have heard your speech, and I was afraid. The things that you're talking about are terrifying. Talking of the judgment, talking of the bloodshed, talking of the spoiler being spoiled. O oh Lord, revive thy work in the midst of the years, and in the midst of the years make known. But in wrath, remember mercy. God, I don't really understand your ways. I don't understand why you would use Babylon as your instrument of judgment. I don't understand, Lord, just what you are doing, but keep on doing it. Revive thy work literally is keep alive your work. Don't stop your work. Now, this is a position of faith. Trusting God when you don't understand God. And just saying, Lord, I don't know what you're doing, but keep on doing it. Keep alive your work in my life. Don't stop your work in my life. But Lord, continue your work even though I don't understand it. But Lord, when the judgment is poured out, don't forget to be merciful. And so he describes it now, this judgment of God that is going to come, that's going to come upon the earth. God came from Teman, and the Holy One from Mount Paran. His glory covered the heavens. The earth was full of his praise, and his brightness was as the light. He had horns coming out of his hand, Horns are always a symbol of power. And there was the hiding of his power. But before him went the pestilence and burning coals went before his feet. Describing now the glorious coming again of the Lord. Brightness as the light. Power as the glory covers the heavens and the earth is filled with his praise as Jesus comes to establish God's kingdom. But before it, there was the pestilence, the great pestilence that we read about in Revelation. Before him, there was that fiery judgment of God 
as the earth is devoured by fire. He stood and he measured the earth. He beheld and he drove asunder the nations. And the everlasting mountains were scattered and the perpetual hills did bow. His ways are everlasting. The judgment of God, the cataclysmic changes that will take place geographically upon the earth in the great days of tribulation. I saw the tents of Cushan or Ethiopia in affliction and the curtains of the land of Midian did trouble. Was the Lord displeased against the rivers? We read that the rivers will be turned into blood. Was thine anger against the rivers? Was thy wrath against the sea that you did ride upon your horses and your chariots of salvation? Your bow was made quite naked according to the oaths of the tribes, even your word. Thou didst cleave the earth with rivers. Uh, it's a beautiful, picturesque thing, the, the, uh, how God has uh, cut uh, the, the valleys with the rivers, did cleave the earth with the rivers. The mountains saw thee, they trembled. The overflowing of the water passed by, and the deep uttered his voice and lifted up his hands on high. The sun and the moon stood still in their habitation. At the light of thine arrows they went, and at the shining of thy glittering spear. Thou didst march through the land in indignation. Indignation is an Old Testament term for the period of great tribulation, often used for the great tribulation. You did march through the land in indignation, and thou didst thresh the heathen in anger. God's judgment as he brings his judgment upon this blasphemous, Christ-rejecting world. And surely the world is ripe for judgment today. Thou wentest forth for the salvation of thy people, even for salvation with thine anointed, and thou woundest the head of the house of the wicked by discovering the foundation unto the neck. God preserving the righteous. Salvation for God's people, for those that he has anointed. God did not appoint us unto wrath. The scripture declares. You did strike through with staves the head of his villages. They came out as a whirlwind to scatter me. Their rejoicing was to devour the poor secretly. But you did walk through the sea with your horses and through the heap of great waters. And when I heard my belly trembled, my lips quivered at the voice Rottenness entered into my bones. I trembled in myself that I might rest in the day of trouble. When he cometh up to the people, he will invade them with his troops. And so this day of judgment coming. And he, and he goes from the local to the um, future, back and forth. It's a little difficult to follow. Uh, but uh, in prophecy there is oftentimes what they call the near and the far fulfillment so that it is applying to a local present situation but also there is a secondary application to the future. So they're coming. It's a day of trouble that will come upon the people as they invade with their troops. And so in verse 17, the prophet declares, although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall fruit be in the vines, the labor of the olive shall fail, and the fields shall yield no grain. The flock shall be cut off from the fold, 
and there be no herd in the stalls. As the result of the siege, starvation. And it was a horrible, horrible time. Josephus in his uh, history books records the horror of this siege, the starvation among the people, uh, cannibalism that finally uh, took over. And as the prophet describes this total lack of supplies, no figs on the tree, no grapes on the vine, no olives, no grain, no flocks, no herds. Yet, he said, I will rejoice in the Lord and I will joy in the God of my salvation. In the midst of this desolate scene, I'll be rejoicing in the Lord. In the Hebrew, the word literally is, I will jump up and down in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. Literally, the word translated joy is spin around in the God of my salvation. It is speaking of a hilarious joy, an exuberant joy, uh, not just smiling and happy, but I mean you're jumping up and down and spinning around in excitement and in joy uh, 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 for the in the Lord. Now, not in circumstances. A few years back, there was a book written called Prison to Praise that had become quite popular as people were encouraged to praise the Lord for everything. No, you can't praise the Lord for everything. You can praise the Lord in everything, but not for everything. And you can always rejoice in the Lord. You can't always rejoice in circumstances. Many times we weep because of the circumstances. But yet, while weeping over the circumstances, we can rejoice in the Lord. If I look at the circumstances, I can get discouraged. I can get despondent. I can feel like giving up. But if I keep my eyes focused on the Lord, then I know that the Lord is in control and I can rejoice in Him. He is my Lord. I'm His servant. He's going to watch over me. He's going to take care of me. I don't have to worry. So there is no visible means of supply. It doesn't matter. My God is able to take care of me and to supply though there be no visible means. We read concerning the time when Elisha was prophesying to the nation of Israel, the northern kingdom. And the city of Samaria had been under siege by the Syrian army. And again, there was a horrible famine. And the Bible tells us that uh, inflation was just uh, horrible. A head of a donkey was bringing 65 pieces of silver. And it got so bad that mothers began to eat their own babies. I mean, it was horrible. And the, when it was brought to the attention of the king concerning a pact made between two mothers to boil their babies and eat them, the king said, God, do the same to me if I don't get hold of that prophet and I take his head off today. And so Elisha was 
there in his house with some of his friends. And he was a very interesting prophet. He had such a close kind of a contact with God that he was surprised when God didn't tell him things. Now, I'm surprised when God tells me something. <laughs> I get all excited and surprised because God showed something to me. God revealed, oh, this is glorious. And, and it, it, I get surprised when God does show me. So he was surprised when God didn't show him. I mean, he lived in such communion with God that the Lord was showing him everything. In fact, you remember at one time when Ben-Hadad was planning these uh, invasions against Israel, he would go to the king of Israel and tell him all the plans so that the king of Israel would have all the troops ready and they were able to stop every uh, venture into the land by the Syrians until Ben-Hadad called together his generals and said, okay, someone of you guys is you know, a friend of the enemies because you're, you're leaking the information. This guy has our plans. He knows them down pat. He, and, and so one of yours leaking, who is it? You're leaking the information to the enemy. And they said, that's not true. We're all loyal to you, but there's a prophet over there in Israel and he knows what you say to your wife when you're in bed at night. I mean, <laughs> that guy's got your number. He's got you wired, man. And and, and so that was the case with Elijah. He was just, you know, tuned in. And so here's the king now threatening to get his head. And, and Elisha's there in his house. And he must have been an interesting fellow to be around because uh, every once in a while he gets sort of a faraway look and you know he's not listening to you. And uh, so you just sort of wait a minute and he says, can you beat that? My, and you know he's got some other revelation from the Lord and so here he was sitting with his friends and he went into one of these things you know he said look what that son of a murderer is planning now he's sending a guy down here to get my neck to take off my head he said when the servant knocks on the door open the door and pin him with it hold him fast for behold, the footsteps of his master are right behind him. And so presently there's a knock on the door and Elisha's friends open the door and they pin the guy back against the door, hold him there. And then comes the king riding up with his general. And he says, aha, at last I've got you. You've troubled Israel long enough. And Elisha said, no, you're the one that's troubled Israel because you've brought in the worship of Baal and all. But he said, don't worry. Tomorrow by this time, they'll be selling a bushel of fine flour for 65 cents in the gates of the city of Samaria. Now, they've been selling a head of a donkey for 65 pieces of silver. And so the prophet's saying they're going to be selling a bushel of flour. For 65 cents. And the fellow, the general, the chief liaison man for the king said, If God would open windows in heaven, could such a thing be? Question, challenged the word of God. Because he was trying in his own mind to figure out how God could so supply so much food that prices would be rock bottom when they are going through this condition of starvation tomorrow at this time. But you see, God has resources that he knew nothing about. One of our problems is our trying to figure out how God is going to do it. How can God take care of this problem of mine. Maybe they'll get my number in the Wheat Reader's Digest sweepstakes. <laughs> okay, God. 
play with their computers. <laughs> Let my number come up, you know. We try to figure out how God can do it. But God has ways that you know nothing about. And so the prophet, though it is absolutely desperate, there's nothing there. There's no herd in the stall, no flock in the fold. There's no fig on the tree yet. I'm going to just rejoice in the Lord, happy in Jesus, because I've got his promise. He's going to take care of me. He's going to provide. My God shall supply all of my needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. So I will rejoice in the Lord. I'll jump up and down. I'll spin around in the God of my salvation. For he declares, the Lord or Jehovah God is my strength. Not trusting in myself, not trusting in my own resources, my abilities. Jehovah God is my strength. And he will make my feet like hinds feet or deer's feet. And he will make me to walk upon Mine high places. I'll rejoice in God. He's going to lift me up above the calamities and the distresses that are coming upon the earth. He's going to make my feet like hinds feet to walk in the high places. He addresses this little Psalm to the chief singer on my stringed instrument. Get out your guitar and put music to it, fellow. And uh, so it can be memorized and sung by the people to remind them that God reigns and that the purposes of God are established and God's kingdom shall come and... The earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord in that wonderful day after God has judged the earth and purged it from the wicked. The righteous shall reign in his everlasting kingdom. O Lord, thy kingdom come and thy will be done in earth even as it is in heaven. Father, we thank you for your word. It is steadfast, it is sure. And Lord, we wait, because even though it tarries, yet it shall come to pass. And Lord, we realize that it's not going to tarry much longer. But the days have come. And Lord, we feel that we're seeing the precursors to the judgment that you have promised that will come upon the earth. Lord, it's time for you to move. Man has turned his back upon you. They've rejected and scoffed at you. They've put you to scorn. Lord, arise. Establish your kingdom. Your reign of righteousness in our hearts tonight and over the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.